that works at the Sixth Floor Museum. She did. She put together a whole bunch of materials on the history of Dealey Plaza. Yeah, they gave me those those materials. Incredible, wasn't it? Yeah, Arlinda Abbott was the one who did it. I've got a copy of the materials in there myself because she was. They were helping her and Gary Mack were helping me a little bit with my book. So when it comes to the history of the plaza, she'll Gary will probably bring her in. She did a lot of research to put that exhibit together. I'm talking to route and not breathing on the microphone. Make sure my uh, battery's good in the microphone. <laughs> Everything? Oh, yeah. That'd, that'd be important. Those mics are actually pretty good at adjusting to whatever the sound level is and their closest source. Yeah, it wasn't like so the BBC radio where he's got this huge microphone and then this little bitty recorder, MP3 recorder or something. <laughs> Just a little bitty thing. But a huge mic to go with it. Okay, you can just talk normal. Whatever my normal voice is. Yeah. That's, okay. That's fine. That's about it. Unless I get excited and start screaming, you know. <laughs> Well, start off and tell me your name, okay. where you live, and what you do. Jerry Dealey, uh, North Carlin. I'm currently unemployed. Um, I am a computer person normally, but it looks like I'm going to be working with my brother who has an insurance agency starting tomorrow, So, but I'm currently unemployed right now. Uh, and uh, where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born in Dallas, uh, North Dallas. Um, was raised here until I was age of eight. My parents got divorced in 61, and I moved away in July of 63 with my mother, stepfather, stepfamily, older brother, and we went up to Denver went for about 20 years. But I came back every summer to visit my father. My father's always lived here, always been here in Dallas. So completely native and came back every summer whenever I got a chance. Lived up there for about 20 years and then came back down. Always intended to come back down. So. Okay. Did you uh, go to college up there? Or did you... uh, community college up in Denver, but I pretty much most of my schooling was up in Denver. So I came back down when I was 28, 29, something like that, back in 83, no, 73, 73, 83, 83. Spent 20 years there. Yeah. Can't add. Computer training pretty well self-taught? Um, community College of Denver, two-year degree, computer training. Came back here, didn't do anything with it there because there wasn't much computer jobs there. Came down here, worked for 14 years with Linux Industries, and last five or six years with Sterling Commerce, a company here in Addison, Texas. So they're pretty much all computers. Uh, pretty much a hacker, mainframe kind of computer guy and stuff. So, telephone, you can just ring, let it wait until it's done. Go to the answering machine. Apparently they didn't want to leave a message. Um, family history? Yes. Okay. Sure. Sure. Uh, switch is right next to you. Noise, background noise. Hope the bubbling of the tank isn't too annoying either. So is your wife from here? Or? No, my wife's from Denver. 
my wife is from Denver, so I met her up in Denver and married her up there, and then we moved back down here. My kids were born here, but she is from Denver. Um, How many kids do you have there? Two, two daughters. Do you uh, have a political affiliation? Republican, no, Republican. not really. Pretty much independent. Um, every year, when, for the presidential election, I always pick the other party that's not in office so I can help select in the primaries who I want to go against the incumbent. So that's about all I do. So this year, I, in 2004, I'll go Democrat just so I can vote in the primaries to see who's going to run up against George W. But no political affiliation, no preference as far as Democrat or Republican or anything. Just pretty much independent. Do whatever I feel needs to be done at the time. Particular so. philosophy No, not really. Not really. Tell me a little bit about your interest in Disney when that began. Disney? I was working for Avis. Um, I was servicing cars for Avis up in Denver, Stapleton Airport, the International Airport up there, the old International Airport. Someone found a hat pin with Mickey Mouse on it, holding out a bouquet of flowers. So I grabbed it, threw it in my hat, and then people started finding Mickey Mouse stuff, and it kind of grew from there. So, you know, anytime anyone found something of Mickey Mouse, they gave it to me while I was there servicing cars for Avis, and then my wife got into the act, and my mother got into the act and started giving me Mickey Mouse stuff. So, Mickey Mouse Disney collection has grown, you know, to, for the last 30 years, and then I started picking up the nickname Mickey from co-workers and stuff because I was so much a Mickey Mouse freak, so, you know, someone had to be in charge of Mickey Mouse computer programs. It was pretty much me all the time, so it kind of grew from there. It's got a little quieter in the last couple of years because it's not as much fun to find things nowadays because you got the Disney store and everything else. He's everywhere. It used to be more fun because it was harder to find. But, so what age was that when you were looking for Oh, I was probably 24, 25, something like that. And so it just was chance that it was yeah. Mickey? Yeah, just happened to find a Mickey Mouse hat pin. And, you know, maybe the Hare Krishnas were giving it to someone at the airport. I don't know. It's just... I got it, threw it in my Avis hat, and after a while, people started giving me Avi Mickey Mouse things. And in Denver, of all places, I don't know why or that, where they were coming from, but if they'd find one in a rental car that we were servicing, I'd end up getting it and got three or four Mickey Mouse items that way eventually. So it just kind of grew from there. You a fan of the movies at all, or just the... Well, I mean, yeah, I see. Yeah, everyone enjoys the Disney movies, but no, I don't have a strong... I don't try to collect all the Mickey Mouse movies I can find or anything like that. We've got a few of them here, but that's because i got kids. So, But the collection's kind of grown to hundreds of figurines and lots of music boxes and just about everything else that I can find that's got Mickey Mouse on it. What is uh, your family relationship to G.B. Um, G.B. D. Lee is my great-grand-uncle. My great-grandfather was Charles Lewis D. Lee, which was his younger brother by four years, four years younger. Um, there were four brothers and four sisters, even though the first, one of the sisters died the first year they came over uh, to Texas from England. And his younger brother, well, his older brother, Thomas William D. Lee, always ran the Galveston News up until his death, um, 1906 or something, but from about 1875 on, he always worked for the Galveston News and pretty much ran it. And when the Galveston News wanted to expand and put a newspaper uh, attached by telegraph to the North, North Texas and the Wheat Center and the Cotton Center of the country, or of the state, um, they sent G.B. Dealey up as the business manager. And he started a 64-year uh, relationship with the Dallas Morning News, is what it became, that started in 1885. And they also had a younger brother, James Quayle Dealey, that also worked for the newspaper towards the end of his life. And he was also, he worked at Brown University. He was a sociology professor at Brown University back in the East, Pittsburgh, somewhere in Pennsylvania, something like that. I don't know where Brown University is. And he also was one of the founding faculty of North Texas State University, or University of Northern Texas, where you're, you're going right now. Um, those were the three that worked for the paper. The other two brothers, Charles Lewis, my great-grandfather, and the younger brother, Samuel David Dealey, never worked for the newspaper at all, and neither did any of their family. Uh, when I was growing up, I was told I was not even allowed to throw a paper, newspaper route, because I was a Dealey. 
and they wouldn't hire um, members of the Dealey family other than the ones that had already been hired years and years earlier. As a matter of fact, my mother won a bowling tournament once that was sponsored by the Dallas Morning News and they asked her to use her maiden name so it didn't look like they were playing favoritism to a Dealey winning a bowling tournament. So that's my relationship to G.B. Dealey. He was my great-grandfather's older brother, so great-granduncle. So how many, how many of the Dealey's came over from the U.S.? Um, the mother and father, George Dealey Sr., um, and then the mother, Mary Dealey, and then there was four brothers and four sisters that came over. And they came over in 1870 and landed in Galveston, Texas, and they were on a sailing bark. They actually built a little lean-to structure on the deck of a sailing ship. Uh, the bark was named the Herbert, and they came over that way from London to Galveston. Uh, George Dealey was a master bootmaker in Liverpool and the Manchester, Liverpool area of England. And he got into some kind of financial trouble, made some loans and everything else, and it all went badly for him, so he managed to borrow enough money to move to come to the United States. And so they came over in 1870. As a matter of fact, the sailing ship was becalmed off the coast of Bermuda, or Jamaica, one of those, for a, a period of a week where they just literally had no wind and couldn't go anywhere. So, but there was a good crowd of them. And like I said, one of the daughters died the first year she was there, but the other seven kids lived on for many years. And eventually they moved up to Dallas, most of them, except for a couple. So how old was G.B. when he came over? He was 11. They came over in 1870, he was born in 1859. And then my grandfather was four years younger than him, so he was seven when it happened. And uh, he started with the Galveston News as a pay or office boy, mail clerk, when he was 15 years old. Um, Thomas William, his oldest brother, had gotten a job with the Dallas Morning, or Galveston News, and started G.B. Dealey there. And like I said, G.B. Dealey was with the newspapers, both of them, and eventually owned them. Um, for 64 years of his life. And so Dealey Plaza was named after him. So he was always self-taught? Yes, he never, he, he finished high school, but he never went to college. Uh, James Quayle, like I said, he was a professor and he ended up going to college, but uh, G.B. Dealey never went to college. He went to night school for a little while in Galveston. And then later in Dallas, he may have done something, um, but I think he was pretty much busy running the newspaper, so he was self-taught. No, actually, my grandfather, um, there was an incident once where one of the Dealey cousins, there was 38 cousins in that next generation below G.B. Dealey, of, you know, nieces and nephews and stuff. And one of the cousins got into trouble with the law, did some Halloween prank, pranks or something like that. And my grandfather went in and saw G.B. Dealey and said, don't publish his name. It's a first-time offense and everything else. And G.B. Dealey said he couldn't play any favoritism, and he went ahead and published the name anyway. And my grandfather got mad at GB, and the two of them never spoke for the rest of GB's life. Now, this happened probably early 30s, or late 30s, early 40s. And so my grandfather never even talked to GB from that day forward. So we didn't have much to do with the entire, that side of the family at all. Uh, my grandfather later moved to California in about 60, and we didn't associate with Ted Dealey, which was GB's son that took over the paper when GB died in, four, in 1946. And we didn't speak to Ted Dealey or Joe Dealey. We didn't pretty much associate with this other family at all. Not, as a kid, from what I remember. Now, of course, I moved away when I was eight, so I don't have a whole lot of memories, childhood memories of it. Um, but we didn't deal with the rest of the Dealey family very much. So did you even have much, I mean, did you only have a negative impression of GB when you grew up? Or did you I didn't even know, well, I mean, GB was dead before I was born. Right. I knew they owned a newspaper. I knew they were the rich side of the family. That's all I knew. Okay? I didn't know much about Ted, who was still alive. Of course, he was alive in 63 when Kennedy was here. And I didn't know anything about Joe, and he was Ted's son, and he was also running the paper. And then Joe Jr. later became the spokesman out at DFW Airport until a few years ago. But I didn't know any of them. I didn't know. We didn't have many family reunions. The Dealey's don't get together very much. So... I didn't have much of an impression of them at all as a child. Did you uh, ever go down to Dealey Plaza when you were a child? 
We drove through it <laughs> back before Central Expressway was really a highway that went all the way to Interstate 45 and kept on going south. We would always go over to visit my aunt, which is over in Grand Prairie, and so we would always go down Central Expressway till it unloaded us into downtown, then we would drive down through Maine or Commerce or out and go out and take the old D Dallas Fort Worth Tollway, which is which is I thirty today. So we would drive through it, but we never stopped. I mean, Dealey Plaza never lent itself because of all the cars and stuff to a lot of pedestrian traffic. Back before Kennedy was shot, you didn't see a whole lot of pedestrians in Dealey Plaza. There wasn't much benches or anything like that. There were a few, but people didn't really. You would think down downtown Dallas, occasionally someone would get out and maybe eat their lunch there, or brown bag and carry their lunch over the park and sit there and eat. But it, since it was kind of a motor park, there wasn't a whole lot of activities going on there. Probably what they're going to do with the Trinity River too, if they end up putting roads and stuff down both sides of it. But people didn't too much traffic; they didn't want to go down to that area too much. Like, uh, I was just wondering, like, if you acknowledged that you were driving through Dealey Plaza at all? Like, you know, oh yeah, I mean, I drive as a kid. I remember going through it and having the statue of G. B. Dealey pointed out to me. You know, that was erected in '48, so it was around from the time I was born. So anytime we drive through it, they'd say. Um, there's the statue. You know, my grandfather always said he wanted to sneak up there one night and put a hat on GB because he's standing out there bald-headed and you know, completely exposed the weather. So he always wanted to sneak by and put a hat. But yeah, I don't have much memory of it other than driving through Dealey Plaza and seeing the statue there, knowing that I'm related to him somehow. And, uh, Un until uh, '63, and then suddenly, you know, great interest in it. But go ahead. Well, now that you research more on. G.B. Dealey, what is your impression of him? G.B. Dealey was a good guy. He did a lot for the city of Dallas. He started SMU. He started some of the hospitals. He promoted city planning more than anybody has ever promoted, you know, a lot of things. He was very forward thinking. He did a lot of really good things for the city. Um, you know, it's, it's appropriate that the plaza was named for him. And it was named for him while he was still alive. It was named when it was first built in 1936. And he had the honor of riding under the triple underpass in the first car to ever go under it, um, what they called a subway back then. But the triple underpass, and he had the honor of riding in the first car under that underpass. They didn't officially, they called it Dealey Plaza, and there was letters and stuff where he knew it was named after him in 1936, but they didn't officially announce it on a citation or anything else until after his death. And that's when the government actually did the paperwork and said, well, we're officially naming it Dealey Plaza. But other than some of the signs down there, there's no real sign that says Dealey Plaza anywhere either. There's also was a whole bunch of myths about him owning that land at one time, and he did not. He owned the land on the other side of the triple underpass from Dealey Plaza, the west side. It was Trinity River bottom land that he bought. Um, he bought it in 1906 or 1905, somewhere around there, and he only had about 17 acres. But it was river bottom land that kept flooding all the time, so it was pretty much worthless. And then when they moved the river, and he pushed real hard for him using the power of the newspaper and the newspaper promoting the ideas, pushed real hard to get access to that entire area that used to be river bottom which is Industrial Boulevard and those areas today and where Stimmons Freeway is today. And at that time, all the bridges went past that river bottom area. They overpassed to it. Uh, Commerce Street Bridge, Houston Street Viaduct, those things went all past that big, wide, expanse of river bottom land. And they built the triple underpass so that they would have, number one, an entrance into Dallas, a grand park entrance into Dallas, which is what the Kessler Plan asked for and also have access to that area on the other side of the Triple Underpass, the railroad tracks. Um, and that was the first access to that entire area. How um, connected was that project to uh, the federal government and the New Deal? And this? It was very connected. Um, the, the building of the Terminal Annex, the white building on the south side of De La Plaza today, was done by the government. It was sponsored by the government. Um, the figure $750,000 comes to mind but I think it cost more than that. But they were going to donate $500,000 into 
the building of Dealey Plaza right next to it. And so they kind of used the federal money there and combination of state and county money with the bond election and other things. And I think the city of Dallas or county of Dallas or state, one of the three, allocated another 500000 or something to that. And they ended up using those funds to build Dealey Plaza and that entire entrance to Dallas. And basically they dug it out. The level of Elm Street and the level of Commerce Street is the natural level of that area. And there used to be an 18-foot bluff, which is where the river was. It, you know, back originally before they moved the river, the river was right there. You go on the other side of the triple underpass and go down that bank where the triple underpass is sitting up high, that 18-foot bluff, that's where the river used to be. And so that was a whole floodplain area. And then they used government money and they used the Works Projects Administration. Of course, this was back in the 30s, so it was built. They tore down the buildings in 34, starting in 34, and it was the triple underpass was built ending in 36. So they used a lot of work projects administration, New Deal, labor, and things like that just to keep people employed and use federal money to do a lot of it. I guess you kind of uh, talked about you know, Dealey coming here and all, but what's his relationship with Dealey? Alfred, I think his full name is Alfred Horatio Bilo. He was a colonel in the Civil War he, for the Confederacy. And he, uh, he got injured, and I don't remember which battle it was. It seems like it was Second Manassas, but I don't know for sure. And he got injured in the arm. You, know, you couldn't shake hands with him. He had problems with his right arm. And he went to work for Sid Richardson, who was the founder of the Galveston News. And the Galveston News was founded in 1842, while Texas was still a republic. And the Galveston News was growing, and Alfred H. Bilo came in as a business manager, pretty much an office manager, for Sid Richardson, who was the editor and publisher of the Galveston News. And they were together for many years, and Richardson died a little while after the establishment of the Dallas Morning News. But GBD Lee was hired by Alfred A.H. Bilo, and A.H. Bilo hired him as an office boy and mail boy, I think office boy first, and then later in the mail room. And when they, so he was the one who hired him at the age of 15. And he worked there with the Galveston News with A.H. Bilo, and when they decided to open up a second paper, G.B. Dealey was so excited about the idea and wanted to be a part of it that they sent him up to help scout sites out. Even though the Galveston News was pretty sure Dallas was going to be the site because of the crossroads of the railroad, the natural crossing of the Trivity that the firm ground gave us here in the area, they pretty much knew that's where it was going to be. But he sent uh, G.B. Dealey up to be the business manager. And then when the Dallas Morning News opened itself, A.H. Bilo moved up here to Dallas as well. And he lived in the Bilo Mansion, which is still downtown at Ross and I forget the cross street, down at Ross Avenue, and it's the Dallas Bar Association building today. As a matter of fact, that mansion is where uh, Clyde Barrow's body was on display for 15,000 people when he was shot. He used to be a morgue at that time. Um, after the Dallas Morning News, then what else did Dealey go into? I know at some point radio and the the radio station WFAAT radio was built in the early 20s and it was the idea of Walter Dealey which was GB's other son his oldest son Walter A Dealey and he had the idea of having a newspaper owned radio and they opened up WFAA radio and it was the one of the first I think in the country but I definitely know in the southwest of a newspaper owning a radio station. And at first it had a real small, like maybe a thousand kilowatt transmitter or 100 kilowatt followed by 500 or something like that. It was for a long time very local. And at one time they put the antenna on the roof of the Dallas Morning News building and they were actually transmitting from inside the offices of Dallas Morning News just kind of sitting out in the middle of somewhere. You'd suddenly have this radio station. But that was Walter A. Dealey's, his oldest son, and he was grooming Walter to take over the paper. But Walter died during the Depression from overexertion. And so that's when Ted Dealey 
Edward M. Dealey, I guess is his full name, actually took over um, as the heir apparent to the newspaper business. So that's where the radio station came from. And then a few years ago, I think the FCC made a ruling where companies that own newspapers couldn't own either radios, I think radios. And so they got rid of their last radio station, I think in the late 70s, mid 80s, and it was the zoo here, a local station is very popular, I think it was the last station they had, KZEW. And, but that was the last one Bela owned because they own a lot of TV stations and they own newspapers and they weren't allowed to own radios as well. I think the FCC this last few weeks has just changed that ruling too. But that's where the radio station came from. So then was it Ted Dealey who decided to get into television? I don't know who actually made the decision for te uh, to get into television. The AH Belo Corporation pretty much expanded. It came from the Dallas Morning News. At that time it owned the Dallas Morning News and the WFAA radio. I'm not sure when WFAA TV came along, but that was the first TV station they owned and still own today. And I think it was just an expansion of the radio, but I'm you know, I'm sure that was in the late forty well, when fifty the fifties because that's when T V made the big boom. So I'm sure it was in the fifties that, that came along, which would have been after G B's death. So it probably was Ted that was in charge of it. Um, the AHB Low Corporation is still the parent company, and the news is kind of held as a smaller one, but the corporation started with the Galveston News and the Dallas Morning News, basically. So, you know, I think about uh, kind of G.B. Daly's activities outside of business. Was he a golfer? Or was he, a he, he liked to take walks. Um, there's a story that he got run over by a mail cart once or a mail wagon or something or almost ran over and started yelling at the driver or something and this was in the book about GBD the Brown book put out by I forget who wrote it but a GBD of the Dallas News is the name of the book and uh, he apparently he got in trouble for obstructing the mails because he was yelling at this guy because the mailman almost ran him over he also there's stories of him walking um, he was a fitness nut as far as walking goes, but he didn't do golf or anything like that. He worked late most of the time and spent a lot of time at the office. He uh, did a lot of extra curricular activities, the Civics Club, the Dallas Historical Society, which he founded, a bunch of other things like that. He also used to take walks and have at least one cigar a day. Um, as a matter of fact, he was walking across the Commerce Street Bridge having a cigar. There used to be a sidewalk along that bridge. It's where Commerce Street is today to the triple underpass, except instead of curving to go under the triple underpass like it does today, it went straight and it raised up above the railroad tracks. It was a bridge. And that's when he was having a cigar one time and he looked at the land over there on the west side of the triple underpass today and said, you know, that might become valuable someday. And that's when he decided to buy the land. So I know he took walks at a regular basis. Um, he was a little bit fitness nut. I think. Whenever he got a chance, he also used to go kind of box or shadow box with bags and stuff at the gym. There's another story of once he found a drunk under his house. He ended up beating the guy up, you know, while the police were coming. And it turned out the guy was a prize fighter that was just completely drunk. And G.B. Dealey managed to beat him up or, you know, get the better of him. Of course, the guy was drunk at the time and G.B. Dealey was sober. But, you know, so I don't, I, I understand he was kind of a walking fitness nut to some degree when he had the time. Of course, running a newspaper, he didn't have a whole lot of time with all the activities he did. So, so is he known much of as a family man or did he work too much? Yeah, he's pretty much a family man. I mean, they went to church every Sunday and um, so on and so forth. You know? And I forgot my train of thought. Yeah, he was went to church every Sunday and they always said when Father Dealey gets home and he tried to make his kids, you know, go to regular meals on a regular basis and be home for that when he could. So he was pretty much a family man. So no scandals or bad stories about him? No, not about GB. I don't have any for GB. There are other members of the Dealey family there's probably scandals about, but GB is pretty much, he, he was pretty much a good guy. And uh, how did he die? Um, he had a normal heart attack. It was just old age. It was pretty much... 46, so he was, so he was born in 59, so I, without doing the math, you know, it was whatever it was, 87, 83, somewhere in that range. 
So it's pretty much a normal heart attack when he died. So he retired at that point? Or did he, stay? he was still working. He, um, well, he pretty much at that time, he was the majority stockholder or controlling stockholder of the stock of the Morning News and Belo Corporation. So he pretty much went in the office that day. Now that one day he stayed home because he said he was feeling poorly and sure enough that day he died. He had seen the doctor that morning and the doctor I think called his daughter Mady Dealey in and said you better see your father because he, he's not looking good and he died with his daughter with him. But I don't think the rest of the family got a chance to get over in time. So. And uh, what was his feelings when they wanted to name Dealey Plaza after? He wanted to turn it down. He thought it was a great honor. There's in the Dealey Library over at the Dallas Historical Society over the Hall of State in the State Fair Park, there are some letters between him and I think it's Ted Dealey. And Ted Dealey was a correspondent at that time over in Austin covering, you know, a reporter for the Dallas News. And he pretty much wrote his father and said, you could, should go ahead and accept the honor. Uh, G.B. Dealey had wanted to turn it down, but he was talked into his family of going ahead and accepting it and allowing Dealey Plaza to be named after him. Now, it's You've got to remember, Dealey Plaza is also the birthplace of Dallas. That's where John Neely Bryan built his first lean-to shack back in 1841, right there at that bluff overlooking the river, right where the triple underpass is today. So there's also the Bryan Colonnade, which is where Abraham Zapruder was standing when he filmed the assassination. It's that whole column that's curved over there that's called the Bryan Colonnade, and there's a sign there that most people pretty much ignore, that talks about the birth of Dallas. And the other colonnade on the other side, the south side of the plaza, is called the uh, Cockrell Colonnade from Alexander Cockrell and his wife, um, Sarah Norton Cockrell. I think I got it. Sarah Horton Cockrell. But it's, so Dealey Plaza was named pretty much for the founders of Dallas and the people that have been promoting Dallas. So it was named for the Bryans and for the Cockrells as well as G.B. Dealey. But G.B.'s first inclination was to turn it down. He, was, he wrote a letter and said, yes, I'm honored, but his first inclination was to turn it down. But Ted, I think it was Ted, talked him into go ahead and accepting the honor. And so they went ahead and did it. Is there any uh, dispute over putting the statue or not? No, I don't think so. I, the statue, pretty much after he died in 1946, they wanted to remember him, and so they put in the statue. It was built, you know, sculpted and put in in 1948. And the bronze relief plaques behind it that shows the different four areas where GBD Lee was helpful in the whole city. Um, I forget what all of them. Education is there, journalism is there, a couple others. There's four different ones because he did a lot for the hospitals and he did a lot for city planning. Mainly city planning, that was G.B. Dealey's biggest contribution to the Dallas area, is he really pushed city planning during his entire time of the Dallas Morning News. So is there, I mean, other than the little things you mentioned about the, you know, almost being run over and stuff, is there any kind of the little stories that people would be surprised to? I don't know of many. Um, I don't even know if, if G.B. Dealey ever became a U.S. citizen. I assume he did. But I know towards the end of his life, he was probably 80, there was a movement in Britain to have him nominated an OBE. Uh, um, OBE? Order of the British Empire. It's, you know, it's kind of like a knighting or an MBE or something like that, member of the British Empire. There's a bunch of awards. But it's something that the Queen and the royal family has to nominate you for. And there was talk about having you nominated for that. But the family tried to get the people over in England who were trying to suggest that um, to not do it because they were afraid that he would try to go over there to accept it. And his health was such, he was, you know, in his 80s that they thought it would, you know, damage his health. So they talked him out of doing it. Um, the other, the other thing that's kind of special too is the publisher of the New York Times always said that he modeled the New York Times, and the guy's name is Oaks. O C H S is his last name, and I forget his first name right now. But he always said that he modeled the New York Times after the Galveston News and the uh, 
Dallas Morning News and said that he always honored G.B. Dealey and called him, they eventually called him the Dean of American Journalism. But the New York Times said it was modeled after the way those newspapers were run. So they gave him a lot of credit at that point, too. Did he, um, did get he a beer here. Get a sip. Take a break. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Did he do any traveling outside of Texas, or did he just go? He did a bit. Um, he married. He married a girl from Kansas City, whose father was in the newspaper business as well. He had met her when she came down from um, Kansas City, and that's also where he got the idea of city planning. He saw that a George Kessler had done the city planning up in Kansas City, had been a city engineer and had done a lot of the work on the St. Louis and Kansas City, I forget which, I think it's Kansas City. And that's where he knew and met George Kessler and managed to hire him into Dallas later on. So he did some traveling, but most of the time he spent running the newspaper, so he didn't do a whole lot of traveling outside of town. He was pretty busy here. He figured there was a lot to do in Dallas. Um, he did things like he started the Dallas Historical Society. He helped promote the Centennial Exposition when it happened down at Fair Park in 1936. He started the Dallas Critics um, Critics Club, which started out just reading books, but then it was business leaders that would, or city leaders that would start talking about ways to improve the city. And a lot grew out of that over the years. So he was involved in a lot of civic activities. I assume his political affiliation at the time was Democrat. He tried to be careful not to go with any party. Um, he was very strong in the Dallas Morning News not supporting one particular party over another. Now, that doesn't mean they wouldn't get politically involved. If individuals, they would promote or, you know, talk against individuals as they seem fit, but they didn't always go one party line. Some newspapers back in that area would be completely a Republican newspaper or um, Democrat newspaper and would always go for that party. Um, but he tried to keep it as even as even-handed as possible. Now I say even-handed, that doesn't mean he wouldn't speak out. If he liked one particular individual over another, he would definitely say something. He helped drive a campaign that got uh, Ferguson way back 1900, I think, 1900s. Ferguson, he drove Ferguson out, I think it's Jim Ferguson, I don't remember the first name, and then later for governor, and he helped getting him impeached or get him to quit. Uh, there was a lot of things he would get politically involved, but he wouldn't go one party or another. He, uh, the Dallas Morning News under G.B. Dealey had a heck of a battle with the Ku Klux Klan back in uh, the early 20s. And the Klan said that it culminated in the selling of the Galveston News, that the Galveston News had been going downhill for some time financially. And yeah, the Ku Klux Klan started boycotting the Dallas News and it was a tough fight for a long time. They would start, stop their advertising, stop buying the paper and everything else, and it was pretty tight for a while. But uh, he did a fight against the Klan, helped get some of the elected officials that the Klan was promoting um, defeated. So, but his politics, I don't think he ever went one side or the other. He always pr tried to stay independent and open-minded so the paper could go one way or the other depending on each individual as they f seem fit. But probably Democrat in his personal viewpoints, I don't know, since most of Texas was at that point. Um, getting back to you, so where exactly were you living in 63? I was living in North Dallas, about where, just a little bit northeast, northwest, excuse me, of Mockingbird, or of White Rock Lake. Um, I'd be about Mark, Mockingbird and Skillman. So it was very North Dallas, south of um, Northwest Highway, a little ways. In 63, Three. and I moved and went to Denver in the summer of 63. So I was up in Denver, I was in third grade, I was eight years old. And when Kennedy got shot. We we were at lunch because we're an hour behind, so it was you know 11:30 our time when Kennedy got shot. We didn't know about it till noon when we went to lunch. Came back from lunch, we were told by our teachers that the president had been shot and killed, and that we had the rest of the day off. And then the next two weeks, I had a 
People knew I was from Dallas. People knew my last name was Dealey. I had a very obnoxious southern drawl. And the next couple of weeks, I got in two or three fights with fourth and fifth graders who say, you know, kill our president, will you, or something like that. Like, I personally did something, you know. But a lot of people from Dallas were treated that way across the country. And I can tell you, third, fourth, and fifth graders are much less civil than some adults, so-called adults. How's that? So, but it was over after a couple of weeks. It was just little kid fights and stuff like that. Nothing you major. Did you just, um, encounter other people who held something against Dallas after that? No, I mean, the kids forget pretty quick. And, you know, I'm only eight at that time, so... I didn't hear a whole lot of it. There are horror stories, and if you talk to some other people, like Darwin Payne, when you talk to him, he could probably tell you horror stories from different people around Dallas. Adults, where they go to restaurants and be told they don't serve people from Dallas here or something like that. There was a lot of that going on the you know couple of years after the Kennedy assassination, or immediately after, definitely. But eighth, ninth, and tenth grader, or eight, ninth, and tenth year olds don't hold grudges that long. You know, it's pretty much on to other things, you know, so. Did you have much of a feeling about Kennedy before he was shot? Did no, I, it, I didn't, I mean, we, I admired him, I remember knowing him, I remember, you know, admiring him as a president, but he was just my president, you know, for an eight-year-old, he was just my president, you know, I didn't know anything about his politics or anything like that, um, I remember in the 1960 elections, which is the first elections televised for the most part, um, yeah, I know it was the first one computerized. I remember my brother was going for Kennedy just because he could say the phrase, you know, Kennedy, Kennedy, he's my man. Nixon belongs in a garbage can. And so just to keep up a fight with my older brother, I went for Nixon. But, you know, it had nothing to do with politics or anything else or liking anyone better than anyone else. I just want to go against my brother. So, you know, I was disappointed when he won, if you want to call that disappointment, you know, because my brother was right and I was wrong. That's all I cared. So... And did, did you, uh, after the assassination, did you spend time watching television? Or you yeah, I, like everyone else, I was glued to the TV set all weekend. Um, all weekend, and then the following Monday, which school was out because that was the day they buried him. And uh, I guess we went to school Tuesday and Wednesday, but that was Thanksgiving week, so, too. So we were off Thursday and Friday of that week. But I think we did go to school Tuesday and Wednesday. But yeah, I was, like everyone else, a, the whole family was pretty much glued to the TV. Now, I was with my step family then, so the name Dealey didn't mean a whole lot in the family because me and my brother were the only ones of the nine of us that were still named Dealey at that point. And I didn't hear hear anything from my family down here during that, you know, by Christmas I'd heard from them or something but that it was shot in Dealey Plaza and stuff, which I already knew. But I didn't hear anything or any kind of reaction from my family down here at all until I came back that next summer. And then... There wasn't much reaction. We didn't talk about it much. It's been kind of a black eye in the Dealey family all along because our name's associated with it. We didn't kind of talk about it. I mean, I think the next time we drove through the plaza, they said, oh, by the way, this is where it happened. And kind of, you know, like everyone else in Dealey Plaza today, pointed at a few things, but we didn't even stop the car. We just kind of saw it as we went through. I didn't actually start getting involved in researching, I think, until fifth grade, which is 65, 66. And then some kid brought in a story, which supposedly was a Life magazine story, and I, I've never been able to find this story, that Kennedy was still alive and was a vegetable living in Parkland Hospital. And, the you know, this is a fifth grade kid that brought this in, a girl from what I recall. And the story basically was that Jackie had visited the hospital many times, but only visited the grave once or twice, and there were certain rooms they, wouldn't, they still had guarded and wouldn't let people in. And the story conspiracy story at that time was that Kennedy was still alive and in the hospital. And then of course that later grew when Jackie married Onassis that said, well, they moved him off. He's off at an island somewhere and everything else. So that was my first conspiracy story that I had heard when I was in fifth grade. So a few years later, I started getting some books and reading on it. When I got into junior high and high school, I got more interested into it. So that was two years after it happened, right? Yeah, 65, fifth grade. How do you think uh, the assassination affected the development of Dallas? 
Um, the development of Dallas, I don't think it affected it a whole lot. Um, Dallas got a black eye, but it wasn't that businesses stayed away. Businesses still came to Dallas. Dallas has still grown pretty well. I mean, Dallas is one of the southern cities that has grown a lot in the last two decades. You know, the whole migration into the southern warm cities and stuff, and Dallas has been a recipient of that. Um, it gave Dallas a black eye for a while, but I don't think most people thought badly of Dallas for any length of time after that. Uh, you know, I know immediately after the assassination, you hear stories that Dallas Cowboys would be you know, booed every time they came on the field or something because they were from Dallas, but it didn't last that long. Um, so I don't think it really hurt the development of Dallas. As far as Dealey Plaza itself, it's, it, it's kind of a two-edged sword. Um, it's unfortunate that Dealey Plaza, which was named after G.B. Dealey and probably named after Brian and Cockrell and all the founders of Dallas, has got a black eye. But the other edge of that store, sword is because Dealey Plaza is the site of Kennedy assassination, a lot more people see the plaza, and it used to be just a secret that just Dallas people knew about. I mean, no one cared about the place. But it's the history of Dallas is pretty much based in that plaza, good and bad. And because of Kennedy assassination, because of the Sixth Floor Museum, there are thousands of people that go into Dealey Plaza every day, or hundreds of people every day. And, you know, every year there are tens of thousands of people that go through there that would never see that plaza and the history it represents if it hadn't been for the assassination. So it's a good and a bad thing. Um, obviously, you don't want your name or part of your city to be known negatively because of the site of where we killed the president, you know, where someone killed the president. And then, of course, there's those people who blamed the Texans and said Dallas was involved with it somewhere, some way along the line. All those theorists on that side. But the fact that Dealey Plaza was the site of killing of Kennedy is kind of sad in some ways. It drags my name, last name in the mud. It drags Dallas into the mud. But at the same token, we get a lot of tourism because of it. So it's kind of a good and bad thing, kind of a double-edged sword. You think it had any kind of psychological effect on the, the politics of Dallas or just the mood of... Yeah, it probably did quite a bit. Um, Dallas... From the days of the Ku Klux Klan, and again, the Ku Klux Klan in the early 20s, before the big stink up in Indiana, um, the Ku Klux Klan was pretty much led by a national, from a dentist from Dallas. It was pretty much the National Grand Imperial Wizard, or whatever the title is. They have so many titles, I don't know what they use. Um, was a wizard. Um, Hiram Wesley Walker, I think, is the name. But anyway, he or Evans. Hiram Wesley Evans, I think, is the name. And he was the Imperial Grand Wizard of the National Ku Klux Klan. And Dallas kind of became known in the 20s as an extreme city because of the Klan. And again, G.B. Lee and the Dallas Morning News and some of the outstanding citizens of Dallas fought the Klan and the Klan finally calmed down. About the same time it moved up to Indiana where the national leader was there and they almost took over the state. But that's completely a different story. Um, and then Dallas, with the extreme right wing, right wing, excuse me, politics, became kind of a city of hate because of that. So the title "City of Hate" actually kind of came up before, long before '63. But then, with some of the incidents with Adlai Stevenson from the ambassador for the UN, you know, a month before the assassination, and the so-called uh, Johnson when he was campaigning in 1960 as vice president, and the spitting incident with Lady Bird. You know, just some of those incidents in the extreme right wing of Dallas, some of its major leaders, um, Edwin Walker, Gen Major General, retired Major General Edwin Walker, based in Dallas, and Ted Dealey, um, the, one, the publisher of the Dallas Morning News, and some of his extreme right wing. Um, it was pretty extreme. Dallas had, after the assassination, Dallas pretty much had to soften up because they were extremely right wing up prior to that and it gave them the very black eye when it happened there. And of course the politics with the police department, you know, how they supposedly bundled, bungled the whole thing and you know, had the assassin killed in their own basement and everything else. I mean, there was a lot of political clout and repercussions from that. Do you um, think there's any particular factor that helped Dallas recover from that or improve Dallas's image afterwards? 
the uh, yeah the the fact that the Dow the Kennedy Memorial today um, the one a block away from Dealey Plaza that came in from basically contributions free contributions completely unasked for paid for that um, the fact that we built a memorial the fact that we didn't tear down there's been push for a long time to tear down the Texas Book Depository back in the 70s there was a strong push the owner of the building. Um, wanted to tear it down, and the city stepped in and saved it. And the fact that the city st saved Dealey Plaza and didn't let it get torn up and destroyed. A lot of people in Dallas would just as soon forget that the plaza's there, tear down, because they always felt it was a black eye. But the city did step in and protected it and kind of preserves it to this day. And that's kind of a good thing, too. I mean, it keeps the history alive and stuff. Even though it's a black eye, it's kind of positive in some ways. Okay. Any of this usable? Okay. So, looking back on it now that you've you know done some research and had some time to think about it, what's what are your thoughts on Kennedy as president, as man? Kennedy, let me see. I was asked this question the other day by the BBC guys, too. Um, rephrase that. Kennedy inspired people. Um, he was young. He had a glamorous wife. He was an excellent speaker, public speaker. He had young kids. You have to remember that when Kennedy was elected, we had had eight years of Eisenhower before that Truman, before that FDR, people were very inspired by a young president, a young dynamic president. Um, he had civil rights pretty much forced upon him. He did a lot of good things with civil rights, and he was doing a lot of good things with um, communism and the Cold War. Good things to some people. Obviously, the right-wingers, such as Ted Dealey and everything else, hated what he was doing with communism. They said he was too soft on communism and they said it to his face. Um, they allowed the black border ads. You know, there was an extreme right-wing area in Dallas that pretty much hated Kennedy. They hated him because he was so soft on communism. They hated him because he was part of the Catholic Irish East Coast establishment. Um, but he inspired people because he was so young, so, you know, dynamic, so um, forward-thinking, so kind of a breath of fresh air. What would you call those black border ads? The black border ad? The uh, morning of the assassination, November 22nd, 1963, the Dallas Morning News ran a full page black border ad. And it was pretty much saying everything bad about Kennedy. Uh, there was a big stink about it afterwards, but Kennedy was shown it when he was over at the Hotel Texas over in Fort Worth. And it was a full page ad done by Weisberg or Weissman or something like that, Weissman. You know, you'll hear about it from other people than me. But Ted Kennedy, or I'm sorry, Ted Dealey, was the publisher of the Dallas Morning News, and he had pretty much was in charge of it. Now, Joe Dealey was his son, and Joe Dealey was the president of the Dallas Morning News at that point. And neither, both insisted they did not approve that ad. It was a full-page um, advertisement paid for by somebody that was completely slamming and detrimental to the president and had a whole bunch of points, whereas, 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 and just completely slammed Kennedy. And um, the Dallas Morning News got in a lot of trouble or a lot of bad opinion about that because of that ad and allowing it. Um, Joe Dealey was supposedly out of town and he didn't even know about the ad until the day of the assassination. And Ted Dealey told Joe he read through the ad and he didn't see anything different in the ad than what he had been saying in the editorial pages for many months. Of course, Ted Dealey did not like John Kennedy. But he always insisted he did not see the ad beforehand. He said he read the ad afterwards. There was some question of if Ted or um, Joe Dealey had seen the ad ahead of time, would they allow it to run? But since it was a paid ad, someone in the advertising department allowed it to go, 
as long as someone was paying for it, they said any pretty much what they wanted to. And it went ahead and went. And they never did quite track down who was responsible for allowing that ad in, or they never really would say. But I know Joe D. Lee Sr., to his dying day, that was one of the most embarrassing parts of his entire life was that ad. And when you talk to Judas Segura, you know, you can get information on that a lot more detail than what I do. But I know Joe hated that to the day he died. Now, Ted Dealey, again, Ted Dealey did not like John Kennedy, so he was never really apologetic for the ad at all. But it was in very poor taste. A few months, the other incident I'll mention, the other incident for Ted Dealey was also the uh, famous Carolyn's Tricycle speech. He got invited to the White House, I think it was September of 62, and he got invited with a bunch of publishers to the White House to our, for a brunch. And when Kennedy came out to the publishers for the brunch, Ted Dealey, again, very right wing, very hateful to Kennedy, started lecturing him on being soft on communism. He said his readers were looking for a strong white knight on a white horse to lead the fight against communism. And what they had was some weak sister president who was riding around on Carolyn's tricycle. And of course, Kennedy was very angry about that statement. Um, Kennedy pretty much retorted that when his constituency being, um, when Ted Dealey's constituency being his readers equal the number of constituents that Kennedy had to represent being the millions of people in America, then he could, might listen to what he had to say. Uh, John Kennedy later, according to one of his cousins, Kerry McCarthy's, you, later when he found out that there was both a morning newspaper, the Dallas Morning News in Dallas, and a afternoon paper, the Dallas Times Herald, he was quoted as saying, boy, I'll bet the people of Dallas really can't wait until afternoons come along. But he despised the Dallas Morning News because of that. And this was part of the environment he was coming into on November 22nd. And of course, the Black Border ad is also a part of the Dallas Morning News legacy treatment, or poor treatment of John Kennedy. Is that the name Black Border ad? Is that just the type of ad? Yeah, it was a big full page ad with a complete black border all the way around it. Um, it anytime you refer to, if you talk to any of the assassination people or any of the Kennedy people, historians and stuff, and you mention the Black Border ad, they'll know specifically what you're talking about. It's that ad they're talking about. I've got a copy of it here somewhere, but. Not original, but a copy of it somewhere. Um, so how has Kennedy affected you personally? Either your opinions on things or things that you've done? Well, n not my opinions on things. I don't think Kennedy, I mean, Kennedy got dragged into a lot of the things that he, he did. Some of the things he did were probably good and would have done them anyway. The civil rights he kind of got pulled into. He didn't have a choice there. He had to make the move. Now, he, I think he made the right moves. Um, the same thing with the Cuban Missile Crisis and the treatment of communism. He kind of got pulled into that. It wasn't something that he intended to do when he got elected. I mean, he did not run based on, I'm going to start working with the Soviet Union and try to become friends with them. That just kind of happened. Um, I don't think he's affected me personally. Obviously, anyone who gets into the assassination, you know, and I've researched it now for quite a few years and read all the books and become a student of the assassination as well. And then I do a lot of things in my hobby time. I give tours and, you know, things like that about Dealey Plaza and assassination type of related things. I've done a lot of tours from people from England for some reason. I'm part of the a group over there led by Ian Griggs and he's an ex-policeman. He leads a group over there that researches the Kennedy assassination called Dealey Plaza UK. And whenever one of them was coming over, he makes sure I give them the tour. So I spent a lot of time reading a lot of the Kennedy books and Dallas history books. And it's kind of a merging of the two that interests me. You mentioned the Kennedy Memorial. Do you know how that got started? And... The Kennedy Memorial got started. Um, a lot of unsolicited donations came in. Um, there was a number of unsolicited donations that came in, both for Tippett's wife. Um, she got quite a bit of money after his death from just donations, people across the country sending money in for her. 
There was also over the next couple of years a lot of donations coming in from people in Dallas City, Dallas County, Texas in general that said we want to build some kind of monument or memorial to uh, Kennedy. And so the memorial, the JFK memorial that's downtown now was approved by the Kennedy family, the design of it, and it was built using that money. Um, I think the money paid for all of it. I don't think there was any government funds done it. Now, of course, they had to allocate the land for it, which is part on Courthouse Square. And I think Eunice Kennedy actually came into town for the dedication of that. And as far as I know, it's the only time any of the Kennedys have ever been back. Um, Eunice is one of the sisters. I don't know. I, I think it was just one of the sisters, not a wife of one of the, of Ted or somebody. But I think it was one of the original sisters, but I don't know that for sure. Um, there's a Kennedy cousin that comes back by the name of Carrie McCarthy, and she comes back on a regular basis, and she attends some of the conferences that happen every November um, here in Dallas. There's always a conference every November of researchers and historians and students of the, of the assassination and stuff. And she comes back on occasion, and I know her. But as, other than that, I don't know any other Kennedy that's ever been here since that day. I know Ted Kennedy won't allow anything to happen in Dallas. He does not like Dallas. The, uh, I think a few years ago, the Special Olympics were considered here, and that's always been a pet Kennedy project. And Ted said, no, we don't want to go to Dallas in any way, shape, or form. Whether or not he treats Los Angeles the same way because that's where Bobby was killed, I don't know. But I do know that Ted Kennedy doesn't want to have anything to do with Dallas, Texas. Okay. No problem. And Carrie, Carrie McCarthy and I kind of have a running joke between the two of us. Ted, Ted Dealey was the guy that, you know, said the Carolyn's tricycle incident and everything else. And Ted Kennedy's the guy who says we won't have anything to do with get Dallas. So. Kara and I both kind of agree that we both have a stinker in our family by the name of Ted, and we just let it go at that, and we get along pretty well. Carrie McCarthy. Um, met her, I think, 1996 at, no, it was 97 at the JFK conference, or the JFK Lancer conference, I should use the full name. And that's a conference that happens every year in November. It's usually, they call it November in Dallas, and it's usually the weekend of the assassination, whatever weekend is closest to the assassination date. They try to avoid Thanksgiving, but they, if, when they can, I mean, occasionally, Thanksgiving is pretty much coming up on that weekend or the 22nd comes up pretty much right before Thanksgiving so but they try to avoid that weekend uh, Thanksgiving but it's a conference and they have there's two conferences that go on most of the time in Dallas every year one of them is COPA uh, Coalition on Political Assassinations and I can't think of the guy's name who leads that I believe it's John Jay um, and he's based out of Washington or Baltimore one of those areas and the other one is the JFK Lancer. And they have competing conferences, and that's run here in Dallas. And they have authors, some of the more famous research uh, researchers, um, so a lot of the authors of the different books, the famous, you know, more popular researchers get together. But they're competing conferences. The leaders of those two groups don't get along. And so it's always a fight as to which conference you're going to. I usually go to the Lancer one, but I have been to both. Um, it's a fight on who's getting along and who's not getting along. There's a lot of infighting in the conspiracy theorists researcher community. Um, is it mostly personal or is it on theory difference? It's mainly personal. Um, I don't know all the background of it, but I know you know, occasionally one group of conference people will start bad mouthing the other group and saying that they're coming up with, you know, saying different things. I know last year in the plaza, 
on the 22nd, there's always a ceremony, a remembrance of, you know, at the time, and a moment of silence and a bunch of speeches. And they claim that they were misbooked and both people were told they could use the plaza at that particular time. And so there was a competition and one of them had a bullhorn and the other one didn't. So the other one didn't get to talk near as much. The one with the bullhorn supposedly turned to the leader of the other one and said, you can use the bullhorn if you want to for 20 minutes and go ahead and do your thing. And the guy refused. He just didn't want to, you know, concede anything to the other conference. So there's a lot of fighting. There's a lot of cutthroat cat fighting among these conferences. And there are some people that kind of go to both. And then you always have to decide between the two, you know, which this session is pretty interesting here, or this session is pretty interesting here, which one are you going to go to? And there's a lot of infighting among the theorists. And this is both the conspiracy buffs or conspiracy theorists is what the one group is always called, and the other group is pretty much the lone nutters, you know, the lone nut people that believe that Oswald did it alone. And I have friends in both areas and both conference groups, but there's a lot of infighting among, the, among these researchers. And the bullhorn incident was just last year? Yes, yes, it was just last year. And uh, the leader of the Lancer group, De Deborah Conway, did have the bullhorn, and she did offer John, again, I think his name is John, to use her bullhorn, but he, he wouldn't do it. And there's a lot of fighting. They're both standing there side by side, holding their banners up and doing speeches to whoever can get heard the best. And, of course, the one with the bullhorn was heard the best this time. So there's a lot of fighting. A lot of infighting. Why do you typically choose the one over the other? It's the one I started with. I they're based in Dallas, so I know them better. Um, I again, I know people from both conferences, um, such as Robert Groden, who's up in Dealey Plaza most weekends. You'll, I'm sure you'll talk to him. Um, he won't have anything to do with the JFK Lancer. He always goes to the Copa conference if he goes to one. And there are different researchers that will only go to one conference or the other. And the one I got started with was the one in the JFK Lancer because it's based here in Dallas. So that's the one I usually go to. But again, I've been to both. Um, my book was available in both bookstores at both this last year. So, you know, I try to stay in touch with both of them and try not to let the infighting get to me. Try not to pick sides. Just kind of go with the flow. Uh, touching back on the memorial, what are your personal thoughts or I think it's a good memorial. It's um, it's kind of kind of plain and calm, but I think it's a very nice memorial. I think it's good intent of the city of Dallas to put it up. You know, it kind of helped our image a little bit. You know, at least we put up a memorial for JFK. I mean, there's probably cities all across the country that had nothing to do with JFK that have got a JFK memorial. I'm sure of it. But the fact that we put one up you know, at least a block away from where it happened is kind of a good thing. It was kind of soothing for the city to some degree, help heal some of the wounds. And uh, the people have been here that may have blamed Dallas or the people of Dallas in some way for the assassination for whatever reason might thank a little bit better of us by the fact that we had a memorial, and especially if Eunice Kennedy, you know, came for the granting of it and the memorial, which was approved by the Kennedy family, the design of it. So I think it's it's a good thing. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the creation of the sixth floor and the controversy over that? Um, I'm not sure what controversy you're talking about. Well, the, the, the people didn't want it and people were afraid of it. Okay. Um, the, I understand. Right. The, the building was owned by Harold Byrd, and he owned it... Oh, for many years. So I, th I think in the late 50s that he picked it up, or mid-40s, somewhere in there, 40s and 50s. And he took over the building and he owned it, and it was, you know, it was leased out to the Sexton Grocery Company for years. Um, some people right after the assassination said it was in the Sexton building. But it was a Sexton Grocery Supply Company for many years that used the building, and then the Texas School Book Company took the building over, or leased the building in 61 or so. And then they had the building for a number of years, and they let it go in the 60s. And Harold Byrd sold the building um, in the late 60s, or maybe early 70s. And the owner of the building, they had a fire, and he defaulted on the loan, and Byrd took it back over. 
and then Bird was going, to, and for all those years, the sixth floor was pretty much closed off. After the Texas School Book Depository closed it down, the sixth floor was closed down, and it was empty and vacant most of the time. Um, you can still see videos and DVDs and stuff and documentaries that show it up there. And then Bird wanted to tear the building down um, in the mid-70s. And a lot of the people of Dallas wanted to tear it down. They thought, you know, it was a black mark on the city of Dallas. It was a black mark on what happened here. We would just as soon tear it down and forget about it. And the other half of that is, you know, it's historical. Whether it happened or not, whether it would really happen from that building or shot, you know, get into all the theories and everything else, it's a piece of history. It should be preserved. And fortunately, the city of Dallas or the county of Dallas stepped in and bought the building from Bird and it's laid vacant for many years. They were using the bottom floors for the administration and of course its full name is today, the official name is the Dallas County Administration Building. But they used it for their offices and left the sixth floor pretty much open. The old Hertz sign was up on the seventh floor for many, many years. And they allowed the sixth floor museum to, or to be built into it in the uh, mid 80s. Now, I'm not sure what controversies there the, you're talking about there, short of the fact that a lot of the people city of Dallas thought it was a black eye on the city and wanted to tear it down from time to time, including Bird, who owned the building at the time. I understood that people were kind of afraid that it was going to be really gaudy, too, if they made a museum out of it. Right, yeah. There was some debate about that. There was some debate about whether or not Dealey Plaza should be made in, I mean, that's kind of how I got involved with writing my book. Um, at one point, there was even some debate about, well, the people running the Sixth Form Museum are going to shut down Dealey Plaza, enclose it, and charge admission to see it. And, you know, the city never wanted to go that way. The county never wanted to go that way. And the people who run the Sixth Floor are county employees. I mean, they do it under the graces of the county. And the city of Dallas and the county of Dallas wouldn't have allowed that. But I know there was some talk at one time out on the forums and the chat rooms that maybe the Dealey family should take the plaza back if they did that. And that's when I realized that no one had a clue of the history of Dealey Plaza. Most of the assassination researchers, that community, they, they could tell you everything about the angles of the shooters and what witness was standing where, and where the shooters supposedly were and everything else. But the history of Dealey Plaza itself, they didn't have a clue. Um, you know, no one wanted to take the time and dig it out of the Dallas history books. And that's when I focused on and decided that we needed to have a history of Dealey Plaza written for the research community as much as anything. I don't consider myself an assassination researcher as much as a Dallas historian. And so I did my book as a focus on Dealey Plaza history. Why Dealey Plaza was there, where it came from. Sure, I mentioned the events of the assassination and what happened to the buildings and stuff before and after, but I don't focus on the assassination itself. I focus on the history of the plaza, how it was the birthplace of Dallas, how you know we tore down other buildings to build it, why it got built there, uh, you know the fact that the river used to be just to the other side, why it was, why Dealey Plaza was there, and why the Texas School Book Depository was there and everything else. And so I pretty much wrote my book as a focus on Dealey Plaza and the history of Dealey Plaza and the history of Dallas Morning News and G.B. Dealey for the, for the research community because there was no book that really focused on that from that angle. So I kind of merged my hobbies, Dallas history, Dealey family history, and uh, assassination into one subject matter. When did you set out to do that? Um... The, the English group, Dealey Plaza UK, Ian Griggs runs it over in London, and I'm a foreign overseas member of Dealey Plaza UK. That's kind of weird. I'm Dealey, you know, I live by Dealey Plaza, but I'm a foreign, foreign overseas member of their group. And he puts out a journal three times a year. And he kept saying he had heard me talk about the history of Dealey Plaza, and, you know, the Dealey family never owned it in any way, shape, or form. And he said, well, you should give me an article give me a background history of Dealey Plaza. So about two years ago, when he was in for November in Dallas, the annual conference in 2001, I pretty much said, okay, Ian, I will write you the article. I will write you that book or that article. And I started the article 
and about nine months later it was too, way too big for him to ever put in a journal. Um, he did put, I think, 14 pages in the journal, but the, he kept saying, well, you know, you've written it, now turn it into a book. And so I turned it into a, you know, a small book, but it's a focus book. I mean, I could have gone on forever on the history of Dallas or on the subject of the assassination, but I tried to avoid being focused on that subject. And so what started out as just an article for his journal turned into a, a small book. So that was the reason for it. And I finished it about October of last year and self-published it. I didn't try to sell it to anyone. I did talk to a couple of publishers. Darwin Payne's one of them with his Three Forks Publishing. And he looked over the book and said he didn't want to handle it at that time. He didn't want to get involved with you know handling someone else's book. So he suggested I go ahead and self-publish it, so I did it. So that's where the book came from. Um, when did you first visit the Sixth Floor Museum? Um, I know I was there for the dedication of the Dallas Historic, or I'm sorry, the Dealey Plaza Historical District, which was done in 93, the 30th anniversary. I was there for that. As a member of the Dealey family, I was there. And so I know I've been in the sixth floor, you know, since that time. And I know I've been up the sixth floor two or three times prior to that, but I can't put a date on it. I've been living in the Dallas area since 83, and I think they built the sixth floor exhibit in 88. So I'm sure I went up there probably 90. And that's just a guess because I didn't really, you know, I don't have a date to really associate with it. But if they opened it in 88... Okay, so I'm sure I went there as early as 90, but I don't know actual dates. And uh, I know you said you're giving people tours and stuff. Do you bring people to the sixth floor as well? I don't usually do that. Um, I tell them that if they want to see the sixth floor, I usually try to arrange for them to go up and see it before I go or before I get there. Uh, the people that have had tours in England, I pretty much say, okay, I'll meet you there at 4 o'clock by that time. Here's what I suggest you see on your own. And I include the sixth floor there. But I, the sixth floor, when you're up there, it's very quiet. Um, people are very respectful. The memory of John Kennedy up there, and I don't want to be up there leading tours and talking and, you know, carrying on. Plus, it's paid for. They have to pay their own way, so I feel like they should go through it at their own pace, and I don't get involved. I would usually, you know, meet them in the plaza and give them a little bit of history of the plaza itself. Um, sometimes I go up to the top of Reunion Tower and give them an overview and give them a lot of history of the city and the plaza. And then I'll usually take them by some of the JFK sites, uh, the Tippett shooting site, the Texas Theater, you know, the graves I can find if need be. Heck, I can even find Bonnie and Clyde's grave if someone's really interested in that subject. Um, I'll cover conspiracy theories to some degree. I won't pretend to be an expert on them and tell them all the theories, but I'll point out some of the major locations and mention some of the major theories. I know a little bit of the politics and, you know, why Dallas hated, or Dallas supposedly hated, the Ken John Kennedy and why the right-wing element was allowed to be here and be so outspoken. But I don't try to go into a lot of details on that. I, I you know, I find out what they want to know. What do they want to hear? I mean, I can't give them a whole lot of facts and figures, but I know most of the stuff. I've been a student at Destination for quite a while. I've read a lot of the books. But, you know, I don't consider myself a researcher. I don't consider myself a theorist or an expert on it. My slant is a little bit more the history. But I can mention a lot of the things that happened and why and who was supposedly involved and what some of the current theories are. But I try to stay, you know, I go to whatever they want to hear, whatever they are more interested in. Every tour is different. You get to get down there and you can tell by their reactions what it is they want to hear about. So it varies every time. I don't have a canned tour. So. You have to bring family guests down there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm members of my own family. I've done tours for them. I've, when I was working um, Sterling, we, had, we sold software for large banks. And I would have people from like Chase Bank in New York come down and I'd have to give them a tour and, you know, help out the company and stuff. And did a lot of stuff where, you know, we would have a conference of our users from our different customers around the country. And that night I would come over and help them with tours and Dallas history and things like that. 
sphere possibly cans on the sixth floor. Pretty positive about the way they did it? I think, yeah, I think it's very positive. Um, that should have been done. I, I would much rather have that than have them tear down the building. Now, the bad side of it is probably the people that are selling their autopsy photos and things like that in the plaza. But I see their point as well that they're necessary to give a counterpoint to the Sixth Floor Museum. You go up to the Sixth Floor Museum and you're pretty much going to see what the official government, both committees, both the Warren Commission and the um, House Select Committee on Assassinations, pretty much you're going to see the official version up on the sixth floor. And I can see that Robert Groden and some of the others, Diane Allen and some of the others down on the plaza selling the papers and the autopsy, the freedom of speech and everything else, it's a counterpoint to the sixth floor. And that's probably the reason the city of Dallas has allowed them to continue down there, um, even though they haven't required licenses. And there have been a few tickets over the years and stuff. But I can see where it's a counterpoint, freedom of speech and all that, to give a second opinion and stuff. Have you gone to any of the seven floor exhibits that they have now? I, the last one I was to, they did have some of the seven floor exhibits that they have now. I think one of them it was Kennedy related. Prior to that, the last time I was in the seventh floor, they had the Pulitzer Prize exhibit. And that one was a little disturbing because they didn't warn anybody and you come up and some of those photos were very graphic. But the last time I was there, it was the uh, something relating to Kennedy. I looked at briefly, but I didn't go into a lot of detail with it. I think that was a good idea to utilize that space. Yeah. Um, let them grow. I mean, you know, if someone's going to pay their money, they should, might as well get both spaces and stuff. Now, they're actually going to take over the fifth floor, too, but that's an administrative function on the fifth floor. Um, I don't know where that stands right now. They've also done a few things in the entryway down at the ticket office and stuff. That's where the history of Dealey Plaza was a little while back, but I don't think it's there anymore. I haven't been down there in the last few months. But uh, I think the seventh floor adds a little bit more to it, but, you know, it, it doesn't go into a lot of detail about theories and conspiracy. Now, there's also the Conspiracy Museum a block away. And they go completely on conspiracies, but it's not just JFK. It's also Martin Luther King and Lincoln and Bobby Kennedy and so on and so forth. But there's a counterpoint to it. But I think opening up the seventh floor is a good idea. I mean, if you're going to pay your $10 or whatever to see the sixth floor exhibit, it doesn't hurt to have an extra exhibit up there or two or three. Now, I have not seen what materials they have up there, though, recently. Like I said, the last time I was there was the Pulitzer Prize traveling show, so, you know, the photographs. Oh, is it? That might be a little bit useless, but... <laughs> um, I don't have the special in the hallway of the Jackie. They, do they still have that exhibit down on the ground floor, or Jackie, the free one? Yes, but it's, it's going to be... They're moving it? Soon. Okay. They have planes on um, so I think you kind of mentioned earlier, but that GB's statue is yeah, no, uh, lonely Uncle George, I almost refer to him as. I mean, you can go over there and stand, well, when you stand down in the plaza, everyone's over on the north side of the of the plaza. I mean, they're over for the, for the JFK assassination. That's pretty much it. Most people don't even realize there is a statue on the other side, and it's of the guy the plaza's named after, and they don't care. Uh, most people, there's a little... Um, Cenotaph there with a flame on top, a stone column there in the north side of the plaza by the reflecting pool with a stone or with a stone flame on top. A lot of people think that was put there for Kennedy, and it wasn't. It was there when the plaza was originally built. There was two of them, and the one on the south side was replaced by GB statue, but that was not put there. That flame was not there for Kennedy. Um, it was part of the original plaza. But most people go down there, they don't know it's the birthplace of Dallas. They don't know that Neely, John Neely Bryan actually lived right there. They don't know that um, Sarah and Alexander Cockrell, who took over Dallas or bought Dallas from uh, John Neely Bryan at one time, lived there as well. They don't know what G.B. Dealey did and why, his, why the plaza is named after him. They don't, frankly, care. So, yeah, again, it's a double-edged sword. It's kind of a shame in some ways, but in other ways it's 
it brings in more crowd than it would have if it was just GBD Lee and the Cockrells and the Nortons, Hortons. So, I guess it's a double-edged kind of thing. How do you feel now just going down there? It, it still has a little bit of effect on me. Um, I don't feel the spookiness and the sadness and stuff as much anymore because I know so much more about the plaza. You know, I know what buildings were there. I know that there was a cafe there right about where the statue of G.B. Dealey was where Bonnie Parker, a Bonnie and Clyde fame, probably worked um, and used to serve Bill Decker, the sheriff, you know, as a waitress in that cafe. You know, I know things like that. So it doesn't have the mystery for me that it, it, it might have for a lot of the people, and I don't feel the awe. It is interesting when I go down there for tours and show people that um, the first reaction is always, I can't believe how small it is. And of course, that lends itself to how easy it would be to shoot someone in that plaza as well. Um, but it doesn't have quite the awe and respect that it used to. It doesn't have the mystery to it that it used to. But I still feel it to some degree. You know? I mean, any time a, a president has been killed somewhere, you can feel a little bit of that and sadness of it and stuff. Still give you any feelings as far as having a family name? Well, I mean, there's a mixed feeling there. There's a little bit of pride of knowing that it's named after your family, but the same token, it's kind of a black eye on the family, too. So it's kind of the, a plaza is the black sheep of the family. You know, that's kind of weird. But so there's a little bit of that feeling there, but you get over it. Yeah, both ways. The, you know, ego in one way that's named after your last name, well, you know, big deal. There's a lot of plazas, you know, all the Fords, Ford theaters named after a Ford somewhere. But which Ford? Who knows? Um, I didn't have much to do with what the actual, none of my immediately family had a lot to do with why the plaza's named, so it's no big deal. But You uh, mentioned the Conspiracy Museum. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the creation of that? And... The mus. <sighs> The Conspiracy Museum was an outgrowth in the old Dow Tex building, and that stands for Dallas Textile, and it's the one there at 501 Elm. There used to be a JFK Museum in there, and that JFK Museum was also, um, was long before it predated the sixth floor exhibit. It was back in the 70s, and they ended up shutting down, and it was a museum for JFK back then, and it was both official and conspiracy. And it shut down, and I think even some of their exhibits were stored in the bottom of the Texas School Book Depository in the basement. And when the basement, when that building had a fire, they, a lot of them were destroyed with water. You can get more information on that from Gary Mack and some of those people. And I think the Conspiracy Museum kind of grew from that. I think the owner of the old JFK Museum, his name was Tom, I can't think of his last name right now, is the one who owns the Conspiracy Museum. Um, I also know John Nagel, who works over in the Conspiracy Museum, and he used to give tours of Dealey Plaza. And I've heard him make the statement that GB gave Dealey Plaza the city under the condition it didn't change and always stayed a public park, which is completely wrong because GB Dealey never owned the land in the plaza itself. Um, and John is still over there, and him I know fairly well as well. And he's since changed his tour. He gives little tours too and he's changed all that ownership stuff. But the Conspiracy Museum gives a counterpoint. John Nagel used to complain that we'd never come over and visit him whenever all the assassination researchers have their conferences once a year. And I kind of laughed at him and said, well, you know, John, in all fairness, when it comes to Kennedy assassination, I've got just as many books as you do. I mean, <laughs> the Conspiracy Museum has a few more paintings on their walls. I didn't paint my wall, but uh, you know, I've got as much materials here as you do over here on the JFK assassination, and most of the researchers in their own houses have so many materials anyway. Why would they pay to come into your museum? Now, I go, always go in and say hello to him, but uh, it serves its point. It gives a counterpoint to the sixth floor exhibit, and on weekdays, that's about the only thing down there for counterpoint. I mean, there's still a few people selling newspapers, but it has its purpose. You know, I don't, don't know how they managed to keep the door open. I don't ever see a whole lot of people there. It's not like the sixth floor exhibit where people want to be there. But it has its purpose. Do you recommend people to go there? I mean, yes. I mean, if you're going to see the sixth floor exhibit, you should go over to the Conspiracy Museum as well. Um, the sixth floor exhibit has a lot more of remembering Kennedy the man. 
It talks about the assassination from the official government viewpoint. The conspiracy Museum will talk about the conspiracy of the assassination and all the theories and the rest of it. And it puts in a good counterpoint. I mean, if you want to see both sides of the story, definitely go into it. So, after all this research that you've done, continue to do in these mm -hmm. conferences that you attend, mm -hmm. what kind of feelings do you have about the conspiracy theories? I do not... You will never prove that Oswald did not do it alone. Evidence that proves that was overlooked by the government intentionally. Now, whether or not they did it for the best motives in the world to prevent World War III and just say, well, we want the American public to think that we captured the guy and there's no one at large, best intentions in the world, you know, or whether or not someone in the government was trying to cover something up, you know, is still on debate by most people. But the fact is, is the investigations focused on proving that Oswald did it alone intentionally. Um, FBI focused on that. Warren Commission focused on that. The assassin, or House Select Committee on, on Assassinations pretty much focused on there might be a conspiracy and the Mafia was involved. You can never disprove that Oswald did it alone. And it is possible, however unlikely, that Oswald did do it alone. There's nothing that happened that was impossible. Um, the, there's some debate about that as far as the throat wound being an exit wound. You know, it, that could be an impossibility. But wounds do strange things, so you'll never be able to completely prove that he didn't do it alone. And that's the reason for that is because any evidence to the contrary was pretty much ignored, overlooked, or hidden by the government. Personally, I don't think he did it alone. I think he was involved somehow. He may not have done the actual shooting, but when he left there and went to his rooming house and got his gun, that wasn't just because the lines at the theater were really bad with popcorn. Okay? He knew somebody somewhere was after him. It's probably my wife just seeing if we're about done yet. my father. So you'd never be able, you would never be able to prove that Oswald didn't do it and never be able to prove that Oswald didn't do it. Um, I don't think even if someone came in and admitted it today, uh, the researchers each have their own theories and if someone comes and admits to it and doesn't answer all the questions and leaves any opening of doubt at all, there would be enough fighting among the researchers that there would be a certain group of them that would never believe it. A lot of that could be economic too. If you have your own pet theory in your own book and someone else comes along and solves it, then your book's not going to sell. So how much of that is, you know, how much of it is self-defeating or self-supporting, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of fighting even among the theorists because there's just so many different theories and any of them can be right, but I don't think Oswald acted alone. I don't think. That's just my opinion, And but we'll never be able to prove it one way or the other because there's a certain amount of the conspiracy theorists that would never accept any explanation. And there have been at least three or four individuals that have confessed to it over the years. Uh, the James Files confession is one. Um, the Ricky White, Roscoe White confession, if you want to call it that, there, there's a number of people that have come forward and said they were a part of it. Uh, the book, The Men on the Sixth Floor, with Loy Factor, I think, an Oklahoma Indian or someone, or Native American, that said he was involved in the shooting. But every time someone comes forward, there's other conspiracy theorists who start shooting holes into that. So I don't know if they'll ever be solved. There might be some document somewhere or somebody's diary or book that someone wrote and hasn't published or hasn't let out of their hands or anything else that might solve it someday, but I have my doubts. I don't think there's any smoking guns left. So do you have any 
inclinations as to who you think would be more likely involved? Or um, there, there's three areas that you got to talk about when you talk about the assassination. I mean, other than the fact that Tippett was shot, just completely ignoring the Tippett side of it. There was the mechanical area of what actually happened. There was the cover-up um, by the government, whether in, you know, because they were involved or because they just wanted to protect the Americans or whatever. That was the second issue, is the cover-up. And then there was the planning ahead of time. Those three areas. You know, a lot of the discussion of which shooter was standing where and everything else is the mechanics. That's the actual event. But the planning is the other crime that's big. If there was conspiracies, uh, conspirators, excuse me, and if there was people planning, and then the cover-up. And that's a third crime, if you want to think of it that way. And it may have been by the government to protect the American people. It might have been the best motive in the world. But technically, it should be a crime as well. Unfortunately, it isn't. Is the same people involved with all three of those areas? That's a different question. I mean, definitely LBJ and John Edgar Hoover pushed the cover-up. Did they do it because they were involved? Not necessarily. I don't know that. You know, I'm not going to speculate on that. But you got to carry those three areas, um, and you got to figure out who did what. Why were each of those three areas done? The cover-up could have been done the best best reason in the world. The mechanics of it is kind of immaterial. Who were the actual shooters and everything else? That's just a names or bodies. And I don't think you know it's it's important because they were guilty, but I don't think any of them are still alive anyway. It's not like they're going to shake up the government if you found out that. You know, this Joe Smith, whoever he was, shot, was one of the shooters behind the picket fence. But who did the planning is the other big thing. And those are the two big areas of the crime that should be solved someday, hopefully, it, but they probably won't be. And those are the ones I'd like to see the most, is, was the government cover-up for the benefit of the people, just a benign cover-up, or was it because someone was trying to cover their tracks? Or was the planning done by anyone in government and so on and so forth? Do I have any pet theories of people I want to pick? No, I don't want to expound on any theories. Again, I'm more of a Dallas historian than I am an assassination researcher, so I don't want to put out any pet theories. What about uh, the opposite? Are there some people that you, or some theories that you just think that's too crazy? The sewer shooter is one. Um, that storm drain, yes, it connects to a drain in the center of Main Street that you could probably walk out of, and I know the men who killed Kennedy had a gentleman that was walking out, and he said the first time they did it in 44 minutes. But it connects to that by a 16 inch pipe. I don't know many people who could crawl through a 16 inch pipe across two streets to get to that other drain. Um, there, maybe, maybe there was a really skinny guy who liked really tight spaces that was a good shot. Maybe. But that's one theory that I just can't believe that the storm drain down at the curb that there was someone taking that. Plus, if you ever try to line up a shot there, there's no chance to line up a shot before the X where Kennedy was supposedly hit occurs. So that's one theory that I don't think, you know, I don't give any validity to at all. Um, I don't know all the different theories. I, you know, I'm not going to speculate on each one, but that's one of my favorites that I don't think happened. So like when you go to these conferences and things, do still you still try to keep the I try to keep an open mind I try to sure. listen to why they're saying whatever they're doing but I, no I don't sit there and heckle them but I will disagree with them um, and sometimes you know I won't do it during the meeting I won't disrupt their their presentation but I'll talk to them and, you know um, for instance um, one of the old lines that I've always heard about the Kennedy assassination is why didn't Oswald shoot when he was coming down to Houston you know, he's coming right at him. He's coming straight at him. If you miss, you've got a second or third shot. And I had a conversation a couple years ago with Craig Roberts, who was an ex-sniper and an author of The Kill Zone and The Medusa Files, but he was an ex-sniper for the U.S. government military. And I said, well, Craig, you know, you're talking about a man who doesn't kill people for a living. It is possible, with the president coming right at him, that Oswald had cold feet. It was possible that if he was a lone shooter, you know, that's a big if, that coming right at him, maybe he hadn't really decided he really was going to do it or not. Maybe he was a little bit scared. I mean, he doesn't kill people for a living. He's not a professional hitman. Someone like Craig Roberts, who is a, was a military sniper, might be able to take the better shot. He might be cold and calculating enough to says, if I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to take the best shot. 
but someone, a rookie like Lee Harvey Oswald, seeing a president come straight at him with Secret Service man standing behind him in a follow-up car and knowing that they have guns, maybe he wasn't sure at that point he was really going to shoot or not. Maybe he, it was after they turned the corner that Oswald said, hey, this is my last chance. I'm either going to do this or not. And then he started shooting. Just the fact that he didn't take the easy shot or the smart shot doesn't mean he wasn't, it couldn't have been Oswald. Just the fact that he didn't take the Houston shot coming up Houston Street, which would have been the easier shot, doesn't mean it's because he had to wait to get him into a crossfire of the kill zone. You know, it could be just as simple as he got cold feet, he got scared, he was nervous, he wasn't sure he was going to go through with it or not. And at the last minute he changed his mind and went ahead and did it. You know, it, it's things like that. I mean, it's kind of a situation they say, well, because he didn't take this shot, he wasn't a lone assassin. He was waiting for them to turn that corner and get into a kill zone so his friends could help him. I mean, one fact does not necessarily mean the other one has to be true. That's very interesting. I've heard that before. Um, so you were, you were living in Dallas when Oliver Stone came here? Before. Yes, yes. Did you go down? I did not go anywhere down there. He, he disrupted traffic. I know everyone in Dallas hated him. Um, because he would come along and disrupt traffic and the drive patterns. I mean, Dealey Plaza is still pretty much people leave through Dealey Plaza. That's from downtown. That's the fastest exit to the highways, the major highways, Stephen Freeway, et cetera. And while he was filming, it was shut down. And I know a lot of people were really complaining about him being down there disrupting the traffic and stuff. But I did not go down there, no. Um, Robert Groden, I think, helped him with that movie. He was a resident expert and stuff on the assassination. But Oliver Stone had no interest in the history of Dealey Plaza, so you know, there's nothing that me or Darwin Payne or any of the other historians, Dallas historians, would be able to contribute. I heard he was a little insensitive to the sixth floor too. Probably. Um, I did not hear all that. I mean, Gary Mack could probably tell you a little bit more about that. I, The whole thing, the way he wanted to do it, yeah, instead of just the corner that he used. Yeah, I mean, they wanted to shoot more stuff on the 7th, but... Yeah. But, uh, what did you think of the final production? JFK was, is, it was a very good movie in that it got people thinking about it again. The, uh, it completely opened up the assassination again. It got the average person thinking about it. It got a lot of people interested again. It probably got the Assassination Records Review Board signed into law uh, because of JFK and because of the controversy it raised. So it was a very good thing for Oliver Stone to do. It was a very good movie both commercially and for the whole subject area of the JFK assassination research. Um, it put a lot more interest into researchers and people who've been trying to dig in this for a long time and a lot of interest into the whole assassination that had pretty much died out uh, to a large degree. It had pretty much gone to the radio talk shows and was just a few nuts over here doing this thing prior to that movie. But that movie generated a lot of interest and got me interested in it again. Of course I always had a you know, passing interest in it because Dealey Plaza and stuff and as they've done different things in the sixth floor exhibit I went down there and stuff. But it was probably the movie that got me back into it again. Take it out any negative effects? Um, yeah, I mean, he took a lot of poetic license. He did a lot of things for drama um, that may or may not be backed. I mean, the whole uh, Mr. X or Colonel X or Colonel Y or whatever it was, um, that whole character didn't exist. It wasn't real did not actually happen with Jim Garrison. That was all a figment of Hollywood. That was kind of a composition of a lot of the different theories. And it was based on a real person, a real researcher. But it didn't it was not based on someone who talked to uh, Jim Garrison at that time. And it's probably, probably brought a lot of um, negative publicity as well to the conspiracy researcher theory, um, especially since the movie kind of tended to point to LBJ. And, um, you know, maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't, I don't know. 
it kind of pointed a finger one direction. Um, LBJ had his problems, but I don't know if, you know. Of course, I knew Madeline Duncan Brown, who was LBJ's mistress, and insisted in her book that he knew about it the night before it happened. But whether or not he heard about it for the first time that evening, or whether he was part of it, is a completely different question. And a lot of people don't even believe Madeline, because he was, she was at a party. Um, some people say at Merkinson's house, but uh, it could have been that just Mer Merkinson was there. And LBJ came in, and according to her, went to a meeting with a bunch of people in the back room. And we came out and said, after tomorrow, those Kennedy, those damn Kennedy brothers will never bother me again. And this was the night before. And then Madeline called him on it months later, the next time I saw it. And he said, well, it was all your Texas oil men friends, according to her book. Now that, in all fairness, that's the most sensational piece of information in her book. But, uh, you know, at JFK, the movie pointed a lot to LBJ. I don't know if, you know, maybe a good thing. Might, another thing of is a lot of people have seen the movie, so now they know what happened and they don't care anymore. Um, there's a lot of that too. They know LBJ did it, so they just take it, the movie as gospel and go from there. So, I don't know. I think it's that all sad that uh, that the one president who died here kind of overshadows the presidents who are from here. No, no, not really. I mean, it's they the presidents who are from here need to earn their own way. Okay, uh, I mean that what happened JFK, you know what JFK did, he earned one way or the other. You know, if nothing else, he earned a lot of mad boyfriends all across the country. Um, <laughs> because of all this fooling around. Um, but he earned his way one way or the other. He earned his place in history, either by being shot or by the civil rights movement or by his role in communism and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Any of those three things would have earned him a place in history. Let the presidents that's from here earn their own place. I mean, they, they shouldn't have to worry about being overshadowed by some historical figure that came before them. You know, I don't care one way or the other. If their feelings are hurt, let them go out and earn their own way. There have been a number of efforts um, to rename Main Street and rename Dealey Plaza. And there's even been an effort to rename the Dealey Plaza Annex. Again, the Dealey Plaza Annex is the area west of the Triple Water Pass, where the little park is, the entrance of Stevens is. And that's the land that G.B. Dealey actually owned. And Judith Segura can tell you this a little bit, because she spearheaded a lot of this. Um, there was a push back in early 90s, about 91 and 92, to rename that as Martyrs Park and to name it not only for the fact that Kennedy was killed there, but also we had some hanings there, some lynchings that occurred back in the 1860s after a fire in Dallas um, and a number of other things. And they sought permission from the Dealey family to rename that and the Dealey family, Judith Segura, went and talked to the Dealey family, the people that are still around the Dealey family that had some influence on that and they didn't mind at all. But for some reason it fell through. Um, they shouldn't rename Main Street because there's a lot of Dallas history that has nothing to do with Kennedy. And Main Street is Main Street. It should stay Main Street. Um, they shouldn't rename Dealey Plaza because it was named after G.B. Dealey and it was you know, in honor of the things he did, the positive things, and we shouldn't rename it Kennedy Plaza or anything like that. My opinion. Um, and uh, what do you think the future holds for Dealey Plaza? Do you think the interest is going to continue? Um, yes. Uh, this is the 40th anniversary. There's going to be a lot going on this year. Um, like I said, there's been some tours already that I've, I've conducted. I know other people conducted it. Um, there's a couple of individuals I know that do tours on a regular basis. There's going to be a lot of interest this year in, in that because it's the 40th anniversary. The JFK movie and the 30th anniversary is the last big interest, but there's going to be a lot of activity there this year. Um, Dealey Plaza should just maintain as a historic site, just like Ford's Theater, just like you know any other place where a major event has happened, just like Gettysburg. It should remain the way it is. 
It's been practically under unchanged since the assassination. I mean, there's been a couple trees added. There's been a couple flagpoles, some lamp posts moved, but it's pretty much the way it's always been, and it should stay that way. And hopefully, we won't go change it or get rid of it. Do you think even when everybody is gone who remembers the event, that it'll continue to have a captivating power? It it still has a captivating power. I mean, people. Um, high school students that had no idea who Kennedy was are still very interested in it because of the controversy, because of the events, any historical event. I mean, look at Gettysburg years and years later and so on and so forth. People will still be interested in it. So, you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to just fade into memory any more than any of the old national parks and battlegrounds and Ford's Theater and anything else has faded into memory. And, you know, that's 140 years ago that Ford's Theater happened. So, yeah, it's going to stick around for a while. And hopefully the city of Dallas will maintain it and keep it up and keep it open to the public and let it, let it stand as a historical significance that, that it is. Um, is there anything you can think of that I kind of missed? Or... No, not really. Maybe the, just the one thing you just mentioned about the hangings that happened in that area. What was oh. this? Um, Dealey Plaza, the courthouse, Old Red Courthouse there, which was built in 1890, 1895, that area, 1890, I think, um, has always been the courthouse of Dallas. It's been pretty much this, uh, John Neely Bryan opened, owned that land, and he de donated it when Dallas became a state in 1845 under the condition that it always remained a courthouse. And they're renovating it now, and they're going to keep a courtroom in it. Um, I... The story goes that the Bryan family could take it back if there isn't a courtroom in it, but I don't know if that's valid or not. There's been talk about it. Um, but Dealey Plaza continues... Where was I going with this? What was your question? The Sorry. Hangs. The Hangs. Okay. Dealey Plaza was always a courthouse in 1860 before the Civil War. There was, it was a 102 degree day, and I think it was July 13th. I could be wrong on the date, but it was in July or August. And it was like 102 degrees outside. And there was a fire that started supposedly in some wood shavings in the W.W. Peak Drug Store right on the west side of Courthouse Square, which would be about where Old Red is today. Um, and it burned 25 area of downtown businesses, most of downtown Dallas. It was a large fire. And they had a committee two weeks afterwards that blamed, blamed it on the slaves. Now, you got to remember, this is 1860. It was right before secession from the Union. And Dallas has always been about 25% black. And even back then, they did the slaves. And they blamed it on three slaves. And I don't remember their names right now. And those slaves were taken down to the end of Elm Street by tree right by the river and hung. And... Uh, I think there was also some Iowa preachers in town, which they said were abolitionist preachers, and they incited the riot and incited the slaves to do it. And they pretty much drove them out of town. I think there was talk about tar and feathers, but whether that actually happened, I don't know. But they drove them out of town. That same day, there was a fire in Denton. There was a fire in about three other towns and cities across the Texas, North Texas, Denton being one of them, or attempted a fire. Now, again, it was 102 degrees or hotter, so, you know, the fire could have started from natural causes, too. But there was a lynching based on that. And there have been a number of lynchings in Dallas and the history of Dallas, and a lot of things have happened around the courthouse, which is right where Dealey Plaza is today. And in the river bottom, again, the river used to be just on the other side of the Triple Underpass. So the river bottom was a very common area for a lot of things to happen. Um, a lot of things with the Ku Klux Klan happened in the river bottoms in that area. There was supposed to be, I think, some 37 definite events happened where someone was beaten or whipped or something down in that area. So there's been there's a lot of history involved in Dealey Plaza. Um, I think Alexander Cockrell, one of the people that bought Dallas in 1853 from John Neely Bryan for $7,000, brought his remaining lots, was shot by a uh, town marshal right there by Dealey Plaza, down where Commerce Street, where the 
terminal annex is, the postal terminal annex is today. He, there was some dispute between him and the new city marshal. The, the city marshal happened to own him money, owe him money, and there was some dispute about that or something else, and he ended up shooting Alexander Cockrell eight times in the stomach and killing him. Um, I don't know if it was an old-fashioned gunfight or what, or what the debate was about, but there's a lot of history in Dealey Plaza that has nothing to do with Kennedy. And, you know, like I said, it's a it's two-edged sword. You know, most people come here for Kennedy, but if they can learn some of that other history while they're here, it's worth it, I think. I think it's kind of a shame that some place historic like Dealey Plaza has to be remembered for JFK being shot, but the same token, it brings the people into the, into the gates. So there's a chance for them to learn something about Dallas history and a little bit about Dallas as well. Thank you very much. If you'd like to hold your book for a second, I'll come in and incorporate some for you. Sure. And like I said, this is kind of a combination of where the history of Dallas, the history of Dealey Plaza, the history of GB Dealey, and the history of the Dallas Morning News intersect. And it was written for the assassination research community, which you know, I thought needed some historical background and context as well. So, right. thank you. Yeah, sure. I'll put it back on the shelf. I'll just take some shots of the okay. shelf. Okay. I'm wired here. You'll give me a copy of your video when it gets done. I'll give you a copy of one of these books. All right. You're going to take that one. You're a photocopy. Shoot that.